I've uh, been an EP now. I, uh, this is my 27th year. Uh, no, that's not quite right. Close to it. And is, I've always been involved in fellows training. It's something I really enjoy. And uh, so it's a pleasure to be involved in this fellows training program. So a little bit about the evolution of um, venous vascular closure. Traditionally, it was done by manual compression. And as a fellow, uh, it's probably your job to do manual compression in most cases. Um, it's an effective way, but um, it takes time. And uh, it requires a lot of bed rest afterwards. And patients usually remember the process of sheath removal and manual compression uh, as really the only thing they remember uh, from their procedure since they may have been nicely sedated for the actual procedure itself. So it often is not the most pleasant thing for the patient. And it certainly makes the concept of early ambulation and same day discharge a far reach. More recently, a lot of studies uh, or a lot of experience has been garnered with using a figure of eight stitch. It puts some pressure on the vein and achieves hemostasis. It gives, uh, it was a big step forward, um, but there's no data for same day discharge or early ambulation with this technique. And it's also a problem for us that we have to return to uh, remove that, those stitches prior to discharge. And uh, on possibly more than one occasion, that does not happen as planned. And there have been some associated groin infections and things like that. Some of you may also have experience with the ProGlide. The Perclose ProGlide was developed for use in arterial closure. And it is an effective device, but it's fairly complex. And it leaves behind a permanent stitch uh, at the arteriotomy site. It can be used for venous closure as well. Uh, but to use for multi-venous closure, it's a little bit uh, cumbersome and time consuming. Um, and for redo procedures, we're just not sure how that will perform over time. The difference also, uh, if you look just visually, uh, the concept of the multivenous uh, closure device is that it provides a mechanical and um, stabilizing uh, biodegradable material external to the vein within the subcutaneous tract. So you can see the difference in terms of a rapidly normal appearing site as opposed to the bunched up tissue we have to use when we do a figure of eight. So workflow is a big issue. Now, we often think about what happens during the procedure. That's usually our biggest kind of area of interest because we're actually doing the therapeutic um, intervention, ablation or putting in a watchman device or what have you. Uh, but what happens afterwards is equally important and um, has a lot to do with patient flow, resource utilization, um, and cost. So our typical model of manual compression and overnight stay has been in place for quite some time. And prior to the COVID epidemic, every patient that I did an atrial fibrillation ablation on or a ventricular tachycardia or PVC ablation or a Watchman device uh, was subject to sheath removal, um, bed rest, and overnight stay on a telemetry bed. And as I'll show you later uh, in this uh, symposium, essentially none of those patients stay overnight anymore unless there's a clinical reason for it. And they're ambulating within two hours of their procedure, so that's VT ablations. PVC ablations, SVT, AFib, and Watchman devices, basically the whole cadre of multivenous uh, procedures that we perform. This one to three hours up and home in two hours has become our new model. Now, it is important to understand that there's a distinction between the concept of early ambulation and same-day discharge. Early ambulation is an important component of our same-day discharge program. But early ambulation in itself has benefits to a patient whether or not they're going to go home. And this is something we wanted to evaluate in the Amblate clinical trial. The Amblate trial was a multi-center randomized trial where patients were randomized either to manual compression, the gold standard, or to closure with the Vascade MVP device and then early ambulation within two hours. There were 204 patients, and you see the sites there. Um, it was a kind of a, a, a very uh, interesting trial because it was a very um, active group of enrollees. You see major centers there you're familiar with. Uh, and we looked at the primary endpoint of early ambulation, timed ambulation, 
uh, any, any complications. And then some secondary endpoints as well, which is uh, time to hemostasis, uh, time to discharge eligibility, in other words, when the patient could theoretically be discharged, time to discharge if they did go home, uh, and procedural success. Now, the results, I thought, were very dramatic and really helped me when I uh, wanted to begin using this device commercially in my institution. We had a four-hour reduction in the time to ambulation compared to manual compression and a nearly four-hour reduction in the time to discharge eligibility. So this was a big change. And also, there was a marked improvement in patient satisfaction. Patient satisfaction is often what the patient experiences before or after a procedure. And what happened after the procedure was dramatically changed compared to the process of manual compression and prolonged bed rest. Also, there was a, a far lower requirement for any sort of additional medication after the procedure, such as use of opioids to control discomfort at the groin site or back discomfort because the patient's been down for so long. We take it for granted that a patient could go through an ablation procedure, which might be lengthy, and then a lengthy uh, period of time where they remain in bed. It's actually quite trying for patients. So eliminating much of that time post-procedure translated to decreased drug requirements and increased satisfaction. With regard to complications, uh, there were only very minor issues in 1% of patients receiving the Vascade MVP device, um, whereas there was a slightly higher rate of minor complications than those having manual compression. There are two different platforms. There's the arterial uh, device, which has been around longer. It's very similar qualitatively to the new Vascade MVP, uh, but the Vascade MVP uh, is approved for use at multi-sites and for larger um, sheath size, as we'll go through. It's the only device now that it's approved for same-day discharge, and I think you'll hear a lot about that from Dr. Mittal later. Um, essentially, the device has gained label not only for early ambulation and use in multiple venous sites, but also for uh, early or same-day discharge. We use it for six to 12 French size C's. So a 12 French sheath includes the cryoablation uh, uh, steerable flex cath catheter, as well as uh, most sheaths used for um, left atrial appendage closure. In addition to your standard sheaths, you may use such as Agilis flexible uh, steerable sheath or other transeptal sheaths. You can do multiple sites on a single limb. And uh, key things about this is there's no sutures left behind. We have an extravascular bioresorbable collagen plug. And it's very easy once you've um, been shown how to do it and uh, you can do it very readily. So what are the trials? Um, the Amblate Pivotal trial you've heard about, that was our randomized trial, which uh, showed us that it is feasible to do early ambulation. After this came the Amblate Impact, which is an economic study. This used data from the uh, Amblate Pivotal trial. And then Amblate Continuing Access Protocol, which continued after uh, Amblate was per, uh, uh, completed and allowed us to continue to use the device and get more uh, information. And then from Sunit Mittal, my partner here, you'll hear about the same day discharge data. The continuing access trial was headed up by Dr. Al Ahmad, who unfortunately got waylaid by uh, bad weather. Uh, but in, in essence, this was a 168 patient trial. We were interested in this trial in looking at different groups that could further show the value of this technology uh, for our patients. So there was what we called the urinary group, which was no Foley catheters. And then there was a protamine group, which was no protamine used in the hemostasis process. And then there was a sort of a pilot of the same day discharge group as well. And we were one of the sites, um, as well as Dr. Mittal and Dr. Al Ahmad, and we found that patients just did not require a Foley. So we no longer use Foley's in our lab. And that's important because it eliminates the risk of catheter-associated um, uh, infection. Uh, it uh, eliminates the risk of um, unintended urinary retention in patients who have prostatism. And of course, patient comfort as well and resources. In the same day discharge group, all of the patients were able to go home as planned and none of them had access site complications. 
or rehospitalization. So again, this was good pilot information that same day discharge is safe and effective. And interestingly, protamine, which is a sort of routine when cheese are pool, uh, pulled, was found to be something that is not required to get good hemostasis using this technology. And I believe you'll hear a little bit more of that uh, from Dr. Mittal. So that's sort of an introduction, and I'd like to bring up Dr. Mittal to uh, tell us how to implement a same-day discharge program. Thanks, Sue. David, thanks very much. <clears throat> I also want to thank Nasir and Cardiva Hemonetics for the opportunity to be here today. So I want to talk a little bit about same-day discharge and first start with uh, the, the, some of the basics. So, you know, it turns out it's pretty hard to know how many AFib ablation procedures are even done in the world today. Uh, but recent data that comes from Wall Street for 2019, so pre-pandemic, um, I think 2020 and 2021 were a bit of a wash, suggests that almost 475,000 procedures are being done worldwide. You see on the bottom still today, mostly for paroxysmal AFib, lesser amounts for persistent and even lesser for longstanding persistent atrial fibrillation. But because this number is growing so rapidly at about 20% a year, we do need strategies that are going to require us to treat more people faster. Uh, and I think towards that extent, same-day discharge will become very important uh, because there will be challenges in just simply admitting all of these patients to the hospital uh, on a routine basis. Now, <clears throat> now, I think it's important to know that data is emerging for the use of these kinds of protocols, irrespective of how you perform pulmonary vein isolation, whether it's with the cryo balloon or radio frequency. And we can get into that in the discussion section, but I think that all of these concepts apply equally you know, to both types of procedures. Now, where these, proce where these concepts may not apply is if you are doing very complex procedures. So if your AFib ablation in a particular individual is way more than a PVI and involves biatrial ablation and the procedure times are very long, well, that will have some implications to your ability ability to same day discharge people. But I think at least for today's discussion, we can focus in on the role with a standard PVI procedure. Now, many of you may already be or may be working at hospitals where same day discharge was very common, but I was very much like David, where just as force of habit, uh, we simply admitted people overnight, but we had a very efficient system where patients would get home uh, you know, very early the next morning. But really COVID, like many things, has forced us to re-look at this uh, and try to understand you know, what is the role of same-day discharge. And of course, there were guidance documents like this published uh, by our colleagues in electrophysiology, giving us uh, some important guidance on how to reboot an EP lab as it came out of the COVID uh, pandemic. And just uh, uh, one of the very important statements that's made in this document document uh, is the recommendation to same-day discharge patients when appropriate. So I think COVID took a movement that was trickling along and really accelerated into warp speed to some extent. <clears throat> now, why is it that we're even able to think about this? Well, we're able to think about this is because at all fronts of the AF ablation procedure, there's been dramatic improvements in, in cutting down the procedure time. And I do think, again, procedure time is very important because it is linked to your ability to get these patients recovered from anesthesia and out the door sooner. What historically, and you know, David and I started EP about the same time, you know, these procedures were long. You know, I think six to eight hours uh, could be a, a, a procedure. Heck, I think when I first started doing flutter ablations, uh, some of them took, you know, four to six hours when we had no idea, you know, what we were doing. But today, there's so many tools that are available for us that really make the average PVI procedure a one to three hour procedure in most hands. And uh, we're using all ultrasound guided vascular access, the transeptal puncture has been very simplified now. Uh, there's improved ablation technology, both on the cryo and RF side. Most labs in the US use intracardiac echo. The net result is you can combine these technologies for safety and efficacy and yet decrease procedure times uh, quite a bit. 
Um, and really, as David has shown, that, that early ambulation using vascular closure has really accelerated a previously forgotten about area, which is what happens to the patients when we're done with them and they're ready and awaiting a hospital discharge. So EPs are very data-centric people, and I do think it's important to recognize that Cardiva deserves a tremendous amount of credit for generating a huge database of actual data to show what the value of vascular closure is. And I think that should be kept in mind when you compare this type of approach to some of the alternatives that David mentioned earlier. I'm not going to redo uh, the, what we found in the Ambulate uh, uh, trial, but again, I I think it is important to note that it did confirm, you know, pretty dramatic reductions in the time to ambulation. Importantly, given the national paradigm and the opioid uh, epidemic, really an important finding of reducing the need for opioids by 58%. You know, no longer do I routinely write for Percocet, you know, post-procedure. And I think that, you know, uh, as a collective whole, that is one of the unrecognized and least well appreciated aspects of what vascular closure does. Uh, anything we do to eliminate even one single dose of an opioid, I think probably contributes very favorably to the national collective to drive down what has become uh, a major uh, public health problem. And not surprisingly, patient satisfaction scores were increased. And, and I think uh, it was really uh, instructive uh, to look at patient satisfaction scores and people who were enrolled in this study who previously had an ablation done where hemostasis was achieved by standard manual compression where each patient could serve as their own control. And it was really in that group of patients where the results were even more dramatic in patient appreciation for what this offered them uh, uh, going forward. Now, again, the data is really starting to accumulate. These are four studies looking at various aspects uh, of uh, same-day discharge, starting with a retrospective study, moving to a prospective PAF study, a prospective persistent study, uh, and an all-comer study. Uh, but what I want to do is just sum uh, uh, summarize by saying there's a lot of data, 650 patients with almost 2,100 plus access sites, 27 investigators at eight centers, and really the big ticket items are what's shown in blue. And 90% of people in whom we wanted to send home same day could be sent home. 99% of patients uh, who were successfully discharged had no need for intervention and follow-up. And really what's really important is there was zero major complications in both the prospective and retrospective studies. So when we look at the needle, you know, we've started with 18 patients uh, who underwent same-day discharge in the original uh, continued access protocol study. And now hundreds and hundreds of these patients are being enrolled to the point where there are now over a thousand patients enrolled in an organized study, uh, which gives us information, you know, about this. And so I think within this upcoming year, we will have even more uh, published data uh, to support the role of vascular closure and importantly, its impact on same day discharge. Now, I want to highlight two uh, 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 studies that were presented in abstract form within the last few months. This study comes locally uh, from the University of Utah group looking at uh, economics. And David's going to go into economics a little bit more. But anytime you start to introduce something today that costs money, you want to really understand how that impacts the overall economics of the procedure. So in this study, what they did was they randomized patients the same day discharge uh, versus uh, overnight observation. Of course, some of the same-day discharge patients uh, went, uh, had to stay overnight, and some of the ones who were intending to stay overnight could actually be discharged home. So by design, not surprising that more of those who were assigned to same-day discharge went home the same day. But what's really interesting is, again, is that those who got vascular closure, again, had higher satisfaction scores uh, and lower bed rest times. And there was uh, lower facility, pharmacy, and disposal costs, higher implant costs. And so the net result was kind of equivalent. It did, did not cost any more in sum to institute vascular closure because the cost of the device was offset by the savings you had in getting patients out of the hospital uh, sooner.
Now, there are barriers, you know, even in your best case scenario, you cannot get everyone home. I really like this study. It's, it's from Vivek Reddy's group where they try to look at, you know, why is it that people cannot go home? See, I'm always blown away by these studies that come that say like, you know, we enrolled 3,000 patients and everyone got home the same day because that's just not our experience. Like even as committed as we are to same day discharge, we find that that's not possible. And what Vivek and his colleagues showed was that there are really three major reasons why you can't get patients home. 43% of the time, it's logistical delays. 42% uh, of the time, it's just prolonged recovery. They take longer than you expect for them to get up from anesthesia. And about 15% of the time, it's some minor complication that precludes them from going home. And we were also very interested in studying that in our, in our practice as we made a, a same-day discharge a routine emerging out of COVID. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about Valley, it's a 450-bed community hospital in northern New Jersey, just across the bridge from New York City. We have three dedicated EP labs. We have six EPs who perform ablations, or about 600 uh, per year. And the way we work is we have a prep and recovery area where patients check in, recover, and get discharged. And it's also the area where the patient and the care team uh, meet before each and every procedure. Uh, since uh, 2015, we've had an alliance with the Cleveland Clinic, uh, and it's part of an HRO uh, organization. So <clears throat> what we have found uh, is this, we reported this at the American Heart Association meetings, is that we looked at 158 patients in whom we wanted to send home the same day. We found that in 14 of them, we could not, again, so many of the things that Vivek reported, minor groin oozing, uh, uh, prolonged hypotension from anesthesia or delayed anesthesia recovery of another type. Maybe there was a groin access thing. But what we found was that if you recovered them for four hours and they were fine at that point and you sent them home after four hours, it was really, really rare for them to have anything crop up. So really, if four hours, they're good, they're going to be good and they're going to be ready to go home. Some of the other takeaways we found were that those who were admitted, not surprisingly, were older, more likely to have heart failure, higher likely to have having TIA or stroke. The most common reason we couldn't, uh, 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 you know, move same day discharge uh, onwards was access site oozing that necessitated additional bed rest. We can talk about that a little bit. Um, probably not surprising because we've eliminated the use of protamine in our lab as well, and everyone's, you know, anticoagulated. So we accept some of that as a bygone conclusion. We also found that even though you're ambulating patients at two hours, it's really about four hours from the time they leave the room till they go home. And there are a variety of reasons that go into that. Uh, if four hours then lines up well with our safety index. But that also does have implication to how practically you can do it. Not uh, every hospital can accommodate same day discharge, you know, for the last cases of the day. You know, if you start a case at three o'clock, you finish at five o'clock, six o'clock, you may not be able to have someone recover till 10 o'clock till they're ready to go home. So every uh, hospital has to look at that on their own. But again, the rule of thumb for us is if four hours are good, they're pretty much all set and there's not going to be a problem. So I just want to add that I think that the same movement to same day discharge following catheter ablation of AFib had of, of course started uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's really gained marked momentum as a result of the pandemic and is probably the standard of care uh, in most high volume labs at this point. But I don't think we're fully there yet. I think vascular closure is an important tool, but we need to actually address a bunch of these other issues, which is how do we manage these cases that go towards the end of the day. You know, what's the optimal anesthesia strategy, including post-procedure pain management? You know, how do you manage fluids, uh, certainly in those undergoing radiofrequency ablation? You know, can it be used when you're having more than PVI and the cases are longer? And I do also think that, you know, there's probably a role to combine this with point of care ultrasound, you know, to make sure that your groins and, uh, and pericardium and all of these things are in good shape, you know, before patients are ready to go home so that there's no need uh, for them to come back. So I'm going to turn now over back to David 
who's going to talk a little bit more about the vast, uh, the economics, and then we'll open up to uh, questions. David. Thanks. That's a wonderful presentation, and I think echoes what has really been a convergence of experience um, with um, early ambulation and same-day discharge. So uh, in case you were thinking this might be a, um, a in-depth uh, economic um, discussion, it will not be in-depth in that manner, but we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about the economics because that's the usual hurdle we have to come over. So just to remind you about Vascade MVP, extravascular collagen plug, bioresorbable. Uh, when you deploy the collagen, it immediately starts to swell because of contact with body fluids up to 13 times its um, initial size. And that provides you that sort of tamponade effect on the external part of the vessel that allows you to get rapid anticoagulation. It's been shown now, and you just heard that protamine is not required. We do tend to give protamine, and the reason we give protamine is that it just allows for more rapid uh, achievement of hemostasis. And we try to do the uh, whole hemostasis procedure in the lab while the patient is being woken up from their anesthesia so that it doesn't really affect the amount of time that the patient is actually in the lab. So I work for Emory, and I've spent my entire career as a, um, you know, an electrophysiologist at Emory. Um, and Emory has three major um, tertiary hospitals and then some smaller hospitals. And St. Joseph's is one of their tertiary hospitals, which I uh, joined once they acquired this hospital. We did a little bit of uh, relocation to make sure everything was properly staffed. So I joined this hospital about seven or eight years ago. It's actually... Um, the oldest continuous hospital in operation in Atlanta, has about 410 beds, depending on the day. The number of beds is actually a fungible number. I didn't really realize that until COVID. Um, and it's a big referral center. It was one of the heart transplant facilities in Emory. Um, it, we decided to not do heart transplants anymore. We concentrate them after the acquisition at the um, university center. Uh, but this is the biggest VAD center in the system. And we do a lot of ablations, over 1,100 a year, and lots of devices. So my initial motivation uh, was after I learned about the ambulance trial and was invited to participate, um, I quickly became uh, a believer in the product and the potential impact it could have. And there are a lot of potential benefits um, once we went from ambulate to same-day discharge. And I listed a few of them here. It's obvious the patient's quality of life, we've shown that very convincingly, is improved. And patient's experience is huge. Patients really don't have a bad experience um, after a procedure because a lot of the bad experiences is what happens when they're awake and having sheaths pulled and having to stay in bed for a long time. So the quality of life issue for me is major. We were very interested in the issue of costs and use of beds. And that was something very important to us. Uh, if patients aren't going upstairs and occupying a telemetry bed, that means that other things can be done with that resource, nurses, beds, et cetera. And that allows other service lines to expand. Most hospitals run pretty close to capacity now. Uh, and having a, more availability is an obvious benefit. It also fits in with my goals as an EP director of how I'm going to build out our service lines and, and participate in the effective and efficient use of resources. The overall cost is something that you can see are not as clear to be, you know, you need objective evidence. We have some, some indirect evidence here and then there's a little more objective evidence which you just heard. Um, but there's some other things in here that we don't always think about which is my quality of life. Uh, if I do um, multiple cases that stay overnight every day that I'm in the lab and have to round on those patients the next day and discharge them, have my APPs writing notes or my fellows seeing them, um, that's a lot of resources and quality of life issues. So, you know, I don't go upstairs too much anymore unless it's to do a consultation or to see some other type of patient. But I don't have patients that have to be discharged the next morning for their routine cases. I don't have patients that have to be discharged on Saturday um, after their uh, uh, case on Friday. And it's actually um, 
ties in a lot to quality of life for me and not just my patient. So how do you get these products in your hospital? Well, we had to do a lot of discussion because um, Emory is very sensitive to costs and particularly St. Joe's uh, where uh, because it, um, it doesn't have the same designation as the university hospital, it has overall lower reimbursement for many of its um, product lines. So anything you add to the cost of the procedure has to be looked at pretty closely. And what we immediately realized with this device was that it's the question of who's paying for it. If I go to my EP uh, direct, uh, cath lab director or whatever, the nursing director or whoever's in charge of products, um, if I say, you know, we want this additional product or service, they look at it as a cost to them. Whereas there are a lot of other people that have to be involved and that's how we made progress with this because the hospital itself is a little more concerned about patient experience or overall device utilization. So a lot of it has to do with who's, who, who, who's carrying the burden of this extra cost. And so it requires us to talk to CEO, uh, CFO type COOs and really get into like what this product can do for our patients. And once we had the data from Ambulate and our own kind of experience with it, uh, we were able to get the product and to expand our program and move along uh, for early ambulation and same day discharge. And again, I think it's important to remember, early ambulation has benefits independent on whether the patient is going home. You should never feel like someone has to go home. It's not a badge of honor or whatever. Uh, and I think Sunit ex uh, explained it very well. There are reasons why patients may need to stay overnight. The obvious ones are medical. Uh, for example, they've had a complication or, they, or their case was more complicated than expected. They need to be observed. Um, or you know, our biggest reason is if the last case of the day isn't quite ready to go home, we cannot then expect to overutilize resources, keeping nurses late to watch this patient just so they can go home. We need to put that patient in a bed and send them home the next day. So you always have to use these sort of just rationale to make sure that you're not sending people home just because you wanna send people home. So COVID-19 really was what helped us really uh, get this going. And of course the special sauce is early ambulation in my opinion, and that's made possible by the MVP system. But when COVID came, there was an early shutdown and most centers experienced this where there, we, people did not know what to do. So elective procedures, which is nearly everything that we do, were the first on the chopping block. We had a three month period of time where cases were dramatically reduced in our hospital. And this turned out to be extremely costly to the whole system. They still haven't recovered from it fully. And so we had to say to them, look, you know, we can keep these patients out of the hospital. We will not utilize nursing resources in the hospital. We will not utilize beds. Uh, we won't, and, and that frees up all those patient flow issues in the hospital, like for cardiac surgery. Cardiac surgeries were being canceled because patients couldn't get out of the unit to a telemetry bed. So patients had to stay in the unit bed, therefore there was not a unit bed available, therefore the surgery could not be done. This was a major issue, and there are all sorts of iterations of why things just got glommed up. So we, in our lab, we eliminated something like 14 uh, patient bed uses per week every single week by not admitting these patients. It was pretty significant. So this was our new approach to same-day discharge. And it's stuck. I don't think it's going uh, away, period. Everyone is accept this as the new norm. And um, it's, we're decreasing time in the PACU, the post-anesthesia care unit, dramatically. We're not waiting for sheath pullers. The patients are happier. Uh, the beds are better. There's no rebleeds. Um, it's all working out exactly ha as it should. Now, does it save money? Well, I think, you know, what it, 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 there's a lot of different ways to look at how it could save money. Uh, we did ask a third party to do an analysis, and this is just an analysis. This is the potential to save money. And what we found is that you could shorten time in the EP lab. You could eliminate um, quantifiable events that have a certain incidence, like, for example, um, catheter-associated urinary tract infections, a need to stay with a prolonged fully because of retention, other things like that, less resource utilization, the cost of going upstairs. You can even look at IV tubing, use of PRN medications. There's a lot of things you can look at. 
But there was a potential to save $1,200 to uh, $2,300 on those sort of things. Um, what's not included is um, how by having more beds available, other procedures can be done. So there's a lot of downstream benefits. I think whether or not we actually can show that we um, save dollars is really not too important to me. I think it's certainly we can have neutrality and still be extremely happy with the process of ambulating patients early and having the option to send them home on the same day. So this is what it looks like for us. Prior to this, every patient who had a Watchman device or a VT ablation or PVC ablation or a um, AFib ablation stayed overnight. And um, officially, none of those patients stay overnight unless there's a reason, a reason and it translates to about a 95% same-day discharge rate at our facility. It's a paradigm flip that occurred almost overnight, and it's been very um, effective, and we've been very satisfied. We have only had one patient, it says zero ED visits, but we recently did have one patient go to the ER the next day, but no intervention was required. Uh, there was a, they just put on some um, stat seal and uh, uh, kept him in bed for a little while and sent him home. So while it's not zero patients having issues, it's, it still remains very uh, close to that. So in conclusion, I feel like there are few things that have had as much impact in the last three years uh, on our program as developing a early ambulation and same day discharge program. We make gradual progress with te other technologies that might seem more sexy and what we do in terms of the intervention during the procedure. Uh, but none of those has had such a overnight effect in terms of affecting the way we practice. I can, it almost seems like a distant memory for me that I had to have all these patients staying overnight and being seen, seen the next day and realizing in retrospect how relatively simple it is to change that. It's just a dramatic effect. So I hope that um, you um, get some experience with this and are able to uh, see. I do believe the future generation of EP fellows will be spoiled just a little bit by the fact that they didn't have to live through the whole uh, overnight for every patient. Thanks a lot.